which, along with uh, yesterday's morning uh, discussion of the thesis, has been scheduled as uh, the main part of the conference. So uh, I think it it's been uh, it will be exciting. Peter, please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go over here. Thank you very much. It's, um, is that okay? Do we need to do anything technical here? Good. Okay. Um, it's my pleasure to be here in, in Belgrade for the first time and to congratulate the organizers of this event on, on having set it up and having got a wide range of people interested in this uh, topic of human enhancement together for uh, such a good discussion. So we've talked uh, about moral enhancement, um, we've talked about uh, cognitive enhancement a bit. Um, so I guess this is the part where we're talking about um, mood enhancement, um, perhaps, but that needs some further discussion uh, to decide that happiness is in fact about mood enhancement. Um, why should we be concerned about enhancing happiness? I think the reason for that is, is fairly obvious, that happiness is an intrinsic value. So um, whereas when we've been talking about uh, moral enhancement and cognitive enhancement, I think these are instrumental goods, and, and clearly very great instrumental goods. I think uh, in the discussion that we had yesterday morning with Julian Savalescu and John Harris, uh, there was agreement on the importance of avoiding various kinds of catastrophes and uh, some disagreement on whether the best way to do that was through cognitive enhancement or cognitive plus moral enhancement. Uh, and of course I don't disagree with that and it's uh, at least arguable that if we value happiness as an intrinsic good then the best way to ensure that we maximize happiness over the long run is indeed to focus on cognitive or moral enhancement, or both, um, rather than to focus on enhancing happiness directly. So I'm not, I'm not challenging that argument. Um, that may well be the case. But if we think that happiness is an intrinsic value, then clearly that's something that we should be interested in enhancing if we can do so directly for its own sake, um, perhaps in addition to these other forms of enhancement we've been discussing. And um, I do want to argue that happiness is an intrinsic value, um, at least an intrinsic value. There's a question, of course, about whether it's the only intrinsic value, as the classical utilitarian tradition of uh, Bentham, Mill, and Sidgwick has argued. Uh, and I think that that may well be a, a defensible claim. I'll say a little bit more about that as I go through the discussion. But um, it's much harder to deny. While one can certainly say there are other intrinsic values, it's much harder to deny that happiness is an intrinsic value. Um, if somebody says, why are you doing that? Then that sets up a chain of, of answers. Uh, why are you jogging this morning? Um, I'm doing it because I think it's good for my health. Uh, why do you want to be healthy? Um, well, uh, somewhere you have to get to a, a, an end with that chain of answers. And uh, one might be, um, I'm happier when I'm healthy. Uh, I suffer less. My positive balance of happiness over, over misery is uh, much higher. And to that, it's, it's hard to see another why question coming. If, if somebody says, well, why do you want to be happy? We tend to say, well, isn't it self-evident that being happy is better than being miserable? And most of us, at least, I think, would be inclined to agree with that. So that does seem to me to be uh, an intrinsic good, and one, therefore, that we ought to promote for its own sake. Um, but. There are many issues that that then raises, and what I want to do is to discuss some of those issues as they've been discussed in the philosophical literature, and then come to questions about can we actually enhance happiness, and what would, it, what would that involve? What would be involved in enhancing happiness? So, 
if we ask what, what is happiness, what do we mean by that, um, I'm going to focus uh, in this paper, um, at least in part, when I looked at the classical utilitarian tradition, I'm going to focus on the work of Henry Sidgwick, uh, because I think that Sidgwick was clearly the most careful philosopher of the trio of Bentham, uh, Mill and Sidgwick. Um, and, uh, Looks, looked at these things with, with much greater care and qualification in his uh, masterwork, The Methods of Ethics. So, Sidgwick identifies happiness with a positive balance of pleasure over pain, and he describes pleasure as a kind of feeling which stimulates the will to actions tending to sustain or produce it. To sustain it if it's actually present, to produce it if you're only imagining it. Imagining it. And similarly, pain is a feeling which stimulates you to action which will um, remove it or revert it. Um, that's not absolutely his final definition, but I won't go into all the complications here. Um, so the important point is that um, for Sidgwick, it's a kind of conscious state. It's a mental state, uh, and it's one pleasure, at least, is what he refers to as desirable consciousness. So you regard it purely as a, a, a mental state in its, for its own sake, something that you can introspect um, and that you regard as desirable qua mental state. It's not, he says, a particular quality of feeling. It's not something you can assess like, for example, sweetness. We have a sense of sweetness, which is a particular kind of taste, and we can assess things as less sweet and more sweet. Happy, uh, pleasure or happiness is, is more diverse for Sidgwick. It's all different kinds of, of feelings that he talks about, from uh, refined and subtle intellectual pleasures and emotional pleasures and uh, the course of sensory enjoyments, uh, as he calls them. Um, so the common feature is that it's something that we want to sustain for its own sake as a mental state, not any particular quality of feeling. Now, there's been a fair amount of discussion of happiness recently, of course quite a lot in the psychology area of psychology, and I'll come to part of that before I finish. But among philosophers, um, I want to look in particular at a, a book by Daniel Hebron called The Pursuit of Unhappiness, which criticizes the hedonistic view that Sidgwick and others are defending. Um, and he says that uh, happiness is not the same as, as pleasure. We don't, in this example, we don't increase our happiness by having some minor pleasure. So um, eating crackers is his example. You might uh, get some pleasure out of eating some crackers, but um, that's too superficial to have any impact on your happiness, he says. These pleasures just don't really get to us. Um, they flip through our consciousness, but they they don't uh, change our state of, of happiness. And that's because he sees being happy as being in a uh, more long-term emotional state, uh, a disposition, a mood or a disposition to be in a certain way. So he compares it, for example, with um, being irritable. If you're uh, irritable, that doesn't mean that you're irritated right now. It just means that various small things will have a tendency to get you irritated. Whereas if you are not in an irritable mood, they might not affect you at all. So being happy in a similar way is a, a mood or disposition that means that you're prone to have various states of enjoyment or pleasure, but doesn't mean actually the same thing. And if we are just talking about what do we mean by happiness, what is, is, is this the common use of happiness, I think you might say that Hebron is really right, that we do use the term in this way to talk about more stable dispositions or emotions. Um, and Sidgwick's account uh, is, is somewhat different. And Sidgwick actually himself probably wouldn't deny that because he, he doesn't claim to be giving an exposition of the common sense meaning of happiness. Rather, he says that's a somewhat vague term and for the purposes of scientific discussion, scholarly discussion, uh, he says it needs to be made more precise, and that's what he's trying to do. But in any case, I don't think anything really important hangs on 
what we say about the term happiness. What is important here is what we regard as intrinsically valuable. And I think uh, Sidgwick's hedonistic theory of value can still be defensible even if you agree with Hebron about the common meaning of the term happiness. All utilitarians would need to do, and Hebron accepts this, is to say that their theories are about pleasure, that it's pleasure that's the intrinsic value here, the intrinsic good, not exactly happiness. Um, so that's, I think, a, a plausible way of thinking it. If, um, uh, so that suggests that happiness, as Hebron defines it, is not really the good in itself. Um, happiness is rather the mood that leads to pleasure. Um, but that's, I think, not really a serious problem for the utilitarian project because um, it simply says we have to reformulate this in terms of maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. And on Hebron's account, it's quite reasonable to say that promoting happiness, as he defines it, is an efficient way of um, enhancing pleasure and minimizing pain. It's an efficient way because the mood that we're in, happiness, is an important determinant of whether we're going to experience these desirable hedonic states, these states of pleasure or not. Um, and Hebron himself says that. Um, he says, for example, suppose you're choosing a career, suppose you're choosing between two different job options available to you. It might be quite difficult to try to calculate whether you'll have more moments of pleasure and fewer moments of pain in one job rather than in the other. Um, because you would have to look through your, your day and try to calculate all of those moments. But if you say, um, this, this job, um, I'm more likely to be happy doing that kind of work, meaning by that I'm more likely to be in an emotional state of happiness, to have a disposition to enjoy things, um, than I am in that job. I think that job's gonna make me unhappy. That's a reasonable kind of shorthand way of saying, well, this job, the one that will make me happy, is going to mean that I will experience more pleasure in my life, in my career, in that particular job. Because the mood that you're in is such an important determinant of the desirability of the states of consciousness that you're likely to have. Okay, so, so far I've defended a Sidgwickian view that uh, the intrinsic good is desirable states of consciousness. And there's a very well-known objection to this view of value. In fact, it was mentioned yesterday, um, I think by John Harris, but I could be wrong, um, about the experience machine uh, proposed by Robert Nozick. So to remind you, Nozick's idea is that we have managed to build this um, machine which stimulates your brain, you get into the machine, maybe you're floating in a vat or something like that, it stimulates your brain so that you have the conscious experiences that you would have if you were doing whatever you've programmed the machine uh, to have to simulate your doing. So whatever it might be that you think you would most enjoy, um, you're reading Pride and Prejudice for the first time, um, you're making an exciting new friend, uh, you're climbing Mount Everest successfully in good weather um, and getting down safely and alive. Um, whatever experiences it is that you want to have that you would think you would most enjoy having, the machine uh, will give to you. And if happiness, as I've suggested, consists of, or pleasure, consists of desirable consciousness, then the experience machine gives you all the desirable consciousness you can ever want. Um, but Nozick's claim is we would not want to get into the experience machine. We would not want to enter it. Um, and therefore, he says, it can't be just states of mind, conscious experiences, that are the only things that are good, because if it were, why would we resist the idea of getting into it? Well, it's a very interesting example, um, but, uh, 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 and it does, in a way, enable you to distinguish between theories of value based on states of consciousness, like hedonism, 
and uh, desire-based theories or preference-based theories like preference utilitarianism, which um, I've supported for most of my career, although as you may see from this paper, I'm starting to um, uh, rethink some of, some of these assumptions. Um, but um, uh, so it does, it does provide a test of that. If I really wanted to climb Mount Everest, not just to have the experience of climbing Mount Everest, I wouldn't get into the experience machine. That's true. And you might think, well, that is what I want, so therefore the experience machine cuts uh, against hedonism and for a desire-based theory or preference-based theory, and uh, that should lead us to abandoning hedonism. But there are a number of issues about the experience machine example, which some people have, have raised over time, um, and they relate in part to, you know, why are we, why are we reluctant to get into the experience machine? Um, I think we are clearly purposive beings. We've evolved to have purposes. And if we had not evolved to have purposes, including the purposes of maximizing our chances of survival and maximizing the chances of survival of our offspring and our, our kin more broadly, um, then no doubt we would not have survived and those genes would not have been in the population. So we, we have a kind of evolved need to act purposively um, and a strong tendency to override immediate pains um, or forego immediate pleasures in order to achieve uh, purposes. And, and that's, as I say, generally a good thing in the real world as it is, because our survival is not certain. Um, and uh, there are also many other purposes beyond our own egoistic interests or family interests uh, that we can do for others. So it is a good thing that we have purposes other than maximizing our own pleasures. But the experience machine asks us to imagine that all of these other purposes have been taken care of. Um, at least I think we have, to, we have to understand the example that way for it to really work. So it's not just that I could get into the experience machine and then I would have these wonderful experiences for the rest of my life. It has to be that everybody else can get into the experience machine too, because otherwise it would be purely selfish of me to get into it, assuming that there are positive things I can do for other people in the world. Um, then I say, well, I'm not going to get into the experience machine because I'm just abandoning everybody else to their miserable state of existence while I blithely enjoy myself. And I don't want to be that kind of person. So we have to imagine that everybody can get into the experience machine. And that raises various problems. Uh, Wayne Sumner has said, how do we know that this is really going to be foolproof? How can we kid ourselves that everybody is able to get into the experience machine and it will go on forever um, uh, in this state of providing everybody with all the best experiences without you know, some fault developing so that uh, we're all left floating in these tanks without any desirable experiences at all? Who knows what's going to happen? So, so that's one problem. Um, we also perhaps have been a little prejudiced, this is post Nozick's example, but maybe we've now all been prejudiced by watching movies like uh, The Matrix, uh, in which we're actually being exploited by others in various ways, and we don't like that idea either. So it hasn't got a good press in that sense. So those are some problems with actually conducting this as an imaginary experiment. <coughs> but there's also... A little bit of interesting data uh, emerged recently about whether indeed and under what circumstances we are reluctant to enter the machine or would be reluctant to leave the machine. I'm referring to research by Philippe de Brigade, um, which uh, you can look up online. I seem not to have quite have the footnote. Oh, I do have the footnote down here if you want to. If you want to look at it, um, it's uh, in Philosophical Psychology in 2010. So um, de Brugard asked people to imagine that they were already connected to the machine. So he's kind of reversing the idea that you're outside wondering whether to go in. On the contrary, you're inside wondering whether to get out. Um, so he, he tells people, look, you're actually in an experience machine um, right now. Um, and you can choose whether to remain connected or to go back to live in reality. And then he randomly offered participants in the survey three different vignettes. A neutral vignette in which they're simply told they can go back to reality, not given any further information. Um, a negative vignette in which they're told that in reality they're a prisoner in a maximum security prison. 
Um, and a positive vignette in which they're told that they're a multi-millionaire artist living in Monaco. So um, of those given the neutral vignette, 46% said they'd prefer to stay plugged into the experience machine. Of those given the negative vignette, not so surprisingly, 87% said they'd prefer to stay in the experience machine rather than be in the maximum security prison. But most surprisingly of all, I think, of those given the positive vignette, returning to reality as a multi-millionaire artist in Monaco, exactly half preferred to stay connected to the machine. Well, what exactly is going on here? It doesn't seem to prefer uh, to support Nozick's confident judgment that we prefer to live in reality rather than plugged into the machine. It also doesn't seem to support the hedonistic view that people are trying to maximize their pleasure. What's the psychological analog of the hedonistic view, I should say. Hedonists needn't be committed to psychological hedonism. Um, because if the latter were the case, then surely more than half would have chosen to leave the machine and uh, live the life of the multimillionaire artist in Monaco. But that didn't seem to happen. So de Brigade had the hypothesis that one of the factors operating here is the status quo bias, the uh, well-known psychological phenomenon that we're more reluctant to depart from a status quo. Uh, to choose something new, uh, and that if you reverse what the status quo is, um, you find the same reluctance sticks to it. So he presented another group of participants with a fourth vignette, which was like the neutral vignette, except that instead of being told nothing about reality, participants were told that their life outside the machine would be not at all like the life that you've experienced so far. So it simply ups the ante, I guess, in terms of the status quo bias. And that did reduce somewhat the number of people wanting to disconnect. Only 41% now wanted to disconnect. Um, I'm not placing too much weight on this survey. The, the numbers were relatively small, so you could question the statistical significance with some of these differences between 41%, 46%, 50%. Um, would be good to see more research on this. But um, it does at least suggest to me that the experience machine is not a knockdown objection to hedonism. That it may well be that the status quo bias is playing a role, that some of the other factors I mentioned, our purposive nature, our, our inability to really accept the idea that this is a foolproof device that would continue forever, that everybody could plug into, that some of these things um, may have led to our reluctance to the idea of actually entering the experience machine if we're outside. And if that's so, then the experience machine would indeed be a uh, very nice happiness enhancer in terms of, or pleasure enhancer, in terms of providing these conscious states, not one that we're likely to have, I guess, in the foreseeable future. So I'm not suggesting this is a practical option for us to try to build, um, but uh, something that, that would do that. Okay, if we think that maybe happiness or pleasure is something that we should enhance, if I've overcome at least uh, one objection to that, and, said, and if that strikes a chord with some of you, then the next question is, in order to say we're enhancing it, we have to have some way of assessing it. We have to say, what is an enhancement here? What is making it better? And of course, there are notorious problems about how you assess happiness um, and well-being, problems of interpersonal comparisons of utility. If we look at the, the history of the development of thought on this area, uh, in this area, it's quite interesting the way it's uh, shifted um, over period, the time since, since Sidgwick wrote around uh, in the late 19th century. Um, Sidgwick had a great uh, pupil, uh, pupil, the uh, economist uh, F.Y. Edgeworth, um, Irish economist, who was very much still in Sidgwick's tradition, thought that what economists ought to be concerned with was maximizing pleasure, maximizing happiness or pleasure. And he even speculated in one of his writings that we could develop a hedonometer, uh, a, a device that measured pleasure, 
and that would enable us to say which policies, therefore, were the policies that we should adopt and which we should not adopt. But that idea didn't get very far, um, perhaps because of practical difficulties in uh, developing this device, um, but also, I think, because economists started to think that um, they really needed to base their, their discipline on something that was more clearly observable. Economics was moving towards more away from philosophy and towards the idea of being a science, so it needed to be based on something more observable. And uh, uh, economists like Irving Fisher suggested instead talking about preferences rather than about states of consciousness. Um, and that became the standard view in economics that we should talk about uh, preferences. Um, even then, economists got hung up with problems about um, trading off where you satisfy some preferences and uh, thwart others uh, about how you trade this off. And again, very reluctant to get into questions of value, they therefore adopted uh, the Pareto optimality as their standard of what is an improvement in social welfare. That is that you only have an improvement if uh, it makes at least one person better off and nobody worse off, thereby forbidding uh, all trade-offs and uh, leaving only very modest applications, I think, really, to most social policy and preventing you defending things that to utilitarians seem obviously good, uh, where they make millions much better off, but they leave one person a tiny bit worse off. Not allowed to do if Pareto optimality is your standard. But more recently, um, the psychological uh, ideas um, that really are in harmony with Sidgwick and Edgeworth have made a comeback um, and struck a blow to the economic approach of, of utility. Um, in particular, my uh, uh, Princeton colleague, now, um, now emeritus, Daniel Kahneman, together with Amos Tversky, showed that the economic model of rational choice, which was presupposed by the idea of, of preferences, doesn't correspond to psychological rationality. Uh, Kahneman and Tversky, of course, developed the idea of framing effects that, um, depending how you put things to people, um, whether the risk of loss is more salient or the prospect of gain is more salient, people will make different decisions. They're more willing to take risks to avoid a loss uh, than they are to make a greater gain. And that suggests um, uh, that the preferences that people express may not really be what we want to base policy on. Um, they also found an endowment effect, which is a bit related to the status quo bias, that if you give people things randomly and then uh, say they can, do they prefer this or would they prefer something else if they could trade with someone else, um, the fact that you've given them something, whether it's a pencil or a mug or whatever it might be, makes them value it more highly than if you've given them the opposite thing, which again doesn't really seem to be a, a rational basis for preferences. Um, and for this, um, uh, Kahneman was honoured with the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2002, which I think is a nice, is a nice irony that um, uh, there's a real serious critique of economics that uh, Edgeworth at least would have enjoyed if he could have been around to, to see this come, uh, making a comeback. Um, because uh, the view of measuring utility that Kahneman develops is actually something that Sedgwick and Edgeworth would have felt quite familiar with, as I'll, I'll come to in a moment. So um, there's a lot of social research going on now uh, based on surveys that ask people, large numbers of people, how satisfied they are with their life. And uh, you might think that this is one way of seeing whether policies enhance happiness or not. There's a Gallup World Poll for instance, that seeks to assess the well-being of people all over the world. Uh, the pollsters ask you to give a number between 1 and 10, indicating all things considered, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? And other surveys ask similar questions. This is not the same as asking how happy are you now? Um, so, uh, in fact, People who describe themselves in answer to these surveys as how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days, 29% of people who describe themselves as completely satisfied with their life 
also report significant symptoms of anxiety and related forms of distress. And more remarkably still, 6% of those who say they're completely satisfied with their life say that they're usually unhappy or depressed. So this is a bit of a puzzle here. How can this high degree of life satisfaction exist with being unhappy or usually unhappy or depressed? Um, it might be that people have set expectations for themselves. Things like, how happy could a sinner like me really expect to be? Well, I'm satisfied with my life. I'm, I'm often unhappy, but that's, that's as it should be. It might be also that in repressive societies, we get that kind of answer from those groups that are repressed whether they're ethnic minorities or uh, women perhaps, lower castes, um, they might have internalized the society's negative attitude to them. So um, that's, it's possible that the answers to those surveys are um, picking up that kind of internalization and therefore lowered expectations. Or it might just be that people like to put on a, a happy face to life when they're asked questions by pollsters. Um, it's not, it's really, it's really not clear. Another problem with, with reports of life satisfaction is that they seem to be uh, susceptible to being influenced by quite minor uh, events that happen just beforehand. So for instance, um, if you arrange things so that people find uh, a coin in a phone box um, before you ask them how satisfied they are with life, um, even if the coin's a, a trivial amount of money, um, you boost their answers to how satisfied they are with their life. Um, another of my Princeton colleagues, Angus Deaton, um, was a bit puzzled, he was doing some of these surveys, he was a bit puzzled that um, uh, as the financial crisis deepened in the United States in early 2009, it seemed that people's life satisfaction was actually improving. Um, and he tried various things to test what, what this was. Um, what he eventually came up with was that um, the question about how satisfied you are, are you with your life was one of a number of questions that Gallup was asking Americans um, at the time. And in 2008, which was a, an election year, as you may remember, um, in 2008, up to November of that year, the questions uh, the question, how satisfied are you with your life, was preceded by a series of questions about what do you think about the political candidates for the office of president at this particular time. After uh, the election in November, um, those questions were, were dropped off. I mean, there were still some political questions, but much less intense uh, political questioning than had occurred. And uh, Deaton tested this and found that being asked what you think about your political leaders before you're asked how satisfied you are with your life has a significant impact on lowering the level of satisfaction <laughs> that you report to the pollster. So um, there's lots of reasons, I think, for being doubtful about asking people how satisfied they are with their life. But what else might you actually do? Uh, this is where I want to get back to, um, as I said, to, to Kahneman's own answer to this, which is more reflective of the sidgwick Edward <coughs> approach. So Kahneman says, if we want to say, what is it that makes a person, let's imagine her name is Helen, what is it that makes, it's, makes Helen happy in an objective sense? He says, we could say that Helen is happy in the month of March, if she spent most of the, her time in March engaged in activities that she'd rather have continued than have stopped, and little time in situations that she wished to escape, and because uh, life is short, it's important to add not too much time in a neutral state in which she wouldn't care either way. So um, Kahneman doesn't actually quote Sidgwick, but he does refer to Edgeworth, and I think this idea of spending time in activities you would have liked to continue is very much the Sidgwick Edgeworth view. Now, how though are you going to measure that? Well, we don't have Edgeworth's hedonometer yet, but we do have mobile phones. So Kahneman got a number of volunteers to allow him to program their mobile phones so that at random intervals throughout the day, several times throughout the day, the phone would ring and they would pick it up and it would say, um, how much are you enjoying, I may not have got the words exactly right, but something like, how much are you enjoying what you're doing right now? And you could then input a number between zero and, uh, and 10, I think, 
uh, or zero and nine, to indicate how happy you are, uh, how much you're enjoying what you're doing at that moment. Um, and if you have that, then that enables you to plot on a graph over time somebody's uh, states of enjoyment. And if there's a, uh, a maybe actually it had maybe it had, maybe it, was, it went from plus from minus minus nine to plus nine or something like that. It, 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 I think if I remember right, it had a zero level in it. So um, if you do that, then you can put that on a on a chart, and the amount of space above the zero line is when you add when you sum that over time is how happy they've been over that period. Now this is is still clearly relate relying on people's own reports but the idea is that it's relying on their reports actually in the moment rather than their subsequent reports and this is this is important not only because of the difference between the question um, how satisfied are you how happy are you right now and how satisfied are you with your life but because of some other interesting work that Kahneman has done which draws the distinction between the experiencing self and the remembering self. So here's a way of, of illustrating that distinction based on research that uh, Kahneman did. He persuaded people who were going to have a colonoscopy uh, to permit him to ask them at various stages of the procedure how they were feeling. Again, you know, what their pain level was, what their distress level was at particular moments during this procedure. Um, and then after the procedure was over, they, they'd given him these reports, they were asked to assess how bad the procedure was overall, and they were asked to make a hypothetical choice between having another colonoscopy, not right now obviously, but some future time, or having an alternative procedure, a barium enema, which is not a very pleasant procedure either. So um, the colonoscopies that they were engaged in um, varied in terms of uh, how long they went on and how intense the discomfort was. Uh, the interesting point about it is that um, you could have two patients, let's say two patients, we'll call them A and B, and during the first 10 minutes of their colonoscopy, they report identical pain states, uniformly negative, uh, significantly negative pain states for 10 minutes, identically. Pain, patient A's experience stops at that point. So it's after 10 minutes of reasonably severe pain, it just stops and it's over. Patient B's experience continues for another five minutes. During that five minutes, the severity of the pain gradually eases, but it never reaches zero. So patient B is in additional pain for another five minutes on top of the pain that patient A experienced. Um, but the pain is less severe. And the patient B is telling you this. He's saying, you know, no, this is, this is negative. When you ask him the stage, he's telling you this is, I'm in, I'm in pain, not as bad as I was before, but I'm in pain. It would seem, if you simply are looking at the moment for moment assessment, that patient B experienced more pain than patient A. That conclusion seems inescapable because patient B experienced exactly the same pain as patient A for 10 minutes plus some additional pain for five minutes. But if you asked patient B, patient A and B to assess their overall experience, it's patient A's assessment that is the more negative. And if you ask them, would you rather have this experience again or the barium enema, um, the response you get, you're more likely to get um, patient A saying, I'd rather have the barium enema, thanks, I don't want that again, than patient B. So how are we to understand this? Um, Kahneman calls, you know, Kahneman who has spent a lot of his career in, in focusing, in, in, in talking about illusions that we have, like the framing effect and the endowment effect and so on, um, considers this another illusion, he calls it a, uh, a focusing illusion of duration neglect. We forget the duration of the experience and we focus on how the experience ended. Um, so I think that this is right, really. I think that that, that is um, what's happening. The question is, which should we go with in trying to decide which patient had the worst experience? Should we go with what seems to be the 
objective indication that patient A had less pain than patient B, or should we go with the remembering remembrance of the experience that both patients have, in which patient B seems to remember the experience more favourably or less unfavourably than patient A. Um, Kahneman in, has written about these in a, in a few occasions, but most recently uh, in his book Thinking Fast and Slow, which is a, a great read and I'd recommend to you if you want a reasonably popular account of this. This is only the, the discussion of this is only a small part of that book, but but the book's good as a whole. Um, and he says. Um, he's a bit ambivalent, actually. He says, the total utility of an episode is the product of average instant utility and duration, which would mean that A had less pain, had a less bad experience. Um, and he adds that retrospective evaluation leads to erroneous estimates of the true total utility of past experiences. But he also says that duration waiting can't be considered a complete theory of well-being because individuals identify with their remembering self and care about their story. A theory of well-being that ignores what people want cannot be sustained. So he then says, quote, the remembering and the experience itself must both be considered because their interests do not coincide, and adds, philosophers could struggle with these questions for a long time. So I guess the way of saying I'm not a philosopher so I don't have to struggle with these psychology. <laughs> Well, as philosophers, those of us who are philosophers here, we do have to struggle with this. Um, and I'm on the side of um, the experiencing self rather than the remembering self, um, as indeed would Sidgwick have been. Sidgwick said we should have impartial concern for all parts of our conscious life. So um, we should not neglect any particular moment of our experience and give it less weight. It's true, of course, we can say that if you remember the experience less badly as being less terrific, then that means that you perhaps now are in a happier state. You are not thinking, oh, that was so awful what I've just been through. It would take me a real trauma. It would take me a long time to get over it. Or maybe I'll have to have that again in a year's time. How terrible that was. Um, I'm just dreading that. Those things will lower your presence though. So of course, I agree, and Cedric would agree, that that's relevant. It is relevant um, to try to make your all your states as good as possible. And it may therefore be <coughs> that it's justified to prolong the colonoscopy a little bit and reduce the pain while you do so, so that people have less unpleasant post-procedural experiences. That's quite compatible with what I'm saying. But I, I do think that the remembering self is not an objective authority on how bad the experience was. That's the point that I want to make. It's the moment-by-moment -moment experience both during the procedure and after the procedure, that is what we really ought to be counting. So if what we're interested in is enhancing happiness, we should be interested in enhancing people's total utility over time, understood in this way. Okay, um, in the last section I want to ask whether we can enhance happiness and some ways in which we might consider enhancing happiness. I think I have still... Ten minutes or so, is that right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Good. So there are some ways of doing this that I think are um, not very controversial. Um, there is a movement now for uh, promoting gross national happiness uh, rather than gross national product or gross national income uh, as a measurement of how well a country is doing. This was pioneered by the small Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan, um, which became, uh, was actually an idea of, of the king at the time when the king was pretty much an absolute monarch. Um, the king, as well as having this interesting idea of promoting the gross national happiness of his people, also had the momentous idea that Bhutan should become a democracy and uh, voluntarily gave up power and set in procedures for uh, electing a parliament which is now functioning, has been since 2008, 
uh, implementing this policy of promoting gross national happiness. And it's something that is uh, an important part of the way the country sees itself. If you fly in to Bhutan, at the airport you will see posters about maximising gross national happiness there. Um, and they have set up a commission. It's uh, promote gross national happiness. Um, and there are things that they have turned down, um, uh, which might have well have increased uh, gross national product, might well have increased the uh, economic measures of how well the country was doing, because it was thought they would not um, promote the overall happiness of the country. And this has become something of an international movement in recent years. Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, when President of France, uh, set up a commission that was chaired by Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz and uh, Amartya Sen, another Nobel laureate, uh, as well as Jean-Paul Fitouzi, to recommend ways of measuring social progress as an economic performance. Um, the Blair government set something up, which is still, I think, functioning in, in Britain. And uh, Australia has also been uh, looking at uh, measuring ways of measuring well-being, uh, as has the OECD, which is publishing now a, a Better Life Index ranking countries on a variety of factors that are related to life satisfaction or, or well-being. Um, Bhutan also achieved a, a minor diplomatic success by persuading the United Nations General Assembly to support a resolution encouraging member states to undertake steps that give more importance to happiness and well-being in determining how to achieve and measure social and economic development. It was not a binding resolution, so this may not make a huge difference. But there is work going on in doing this. So um, I think, as I say, that's not really very controversial anymore. Um, the question, rather, is how do we decide what social policies are better going to promote happiness. And there are questions raised about um, whether they are likely to be effective. Uh, there's some suggestions that people have a kind of happiness set point, um, that uh, if you get something that you want, your happiness level will rise temporarily, but um, you will adapt to it, and your happiness level will drop roughly to where it was. Conversely, if something bad happens to you, um, your happiness level will temporarily fall, but it will gradually return to your set point. So that's something worth questioning, whether indeed we can achieve uh, long-lasting changes in, in happiness. Um, but various things that people might talk about are promoting the uh, social conditions in which we see our own happiness as more closely linked to others. Um, it was pointed out, I can't remember where I got this reference from uh, now, but it was pointed out that um, there's a common word for happiness uh, at the sorrows of others, the German Schadenfreude, um, but we don't really have a word for, a single word for happiness at the happiness of others. It's been suggested uh, there's a word in Yiddish, Shepnakis, um, which could be adopted, um, but it's certainly a nicer idea, and uh, the idea that uh, we do take happiness, whether we could create social conditions for increasing our happiness in uh, uh, when we see others happier or make others happy is certainly something that we might want to do. Now, um, what about more technical measures of increasing happiness uh, along the lines of some of the things that were discussed with uh, uh, moral enhancement in yesterday's session? What is there feasible here? I haven't come across um, a huge number of, of suggestions here, but one that is worth mentioning um, is the proposal of uh, adding lithium to drinking water uh, in areas that are naturally low in lithium. Uh, the amount of lithium in drinking, waters, uh, in drinking water varies naturally. Um, and as you may know, lithium is a substance used in, uh, to treat people who have uh, bipolar conditions um, and reduces suicide in, in people who are on that treatment. And something similar has been shown to happen with varying levels of naturally occurring lithium. So studies in both Japan and Austria have found an inverse correlation between the amount of lithium in drinking water and the suicide rate in the region. 
Um, for example, in the 10 most lithium depleted regions in Austria, the suicide rate was 16 per 100,000. In the 10 most lithium rich regions, the suicide rate was just 11 per 100,000. It's not a dramatic difference, but um, if you can save five lives by something as simple as putting a really very modest amount within the natural range and nothing like the amount that people taking lithium tablets are, are taking, um, that would seem like it might be something worth doing. And uh, the suicide rate is a very crude measure of uh, what good this is doing. It's entirely possible that it actually improves the mood of the majority of people to some degree. I haven't seen any studies that have attempted to assess that. Um, thanks. Uh, there's also a Texas study that finds um, not only an inverse correlation with suicide, but extends this to violent crime and rape. Um, very small differences, but significant. So that's uh, one possibility of a mood-altering drug um, which, which you just might be able to get um, public acceptance because of the fact that it's there naturally in the water anyway and that it varies. There were similar studies with fluoride at the time of uh, campaigns to put fluoride in the water to reduce dental cavities. The fact that there were naturally varying levels of fluoride and that all we were doing was adding to the lower levels to bring it up to, towards closer to the higher levels I think made it more possible to do this in at least some countries, not in every country. Um, so something like that might be possible, again, in, in some countries, probably not in those that are more suspicious about governments. Um, so what about other kinds of mood-altering drugs? Um, obviously, the Aldous Huxley's uh, Soma is the kind of example here, if, uh, if something like that were available, that gave us more pleasure without any kind of uh, negative effects. Um, some people would worry that this would reduce our um, productivity, our ambition. We would not be so interested in uh, trying to achieve things. And in a world in which there's a lot that still needs to be done, then you might see that as, as a negative. So it's the same point as about not entering the experience machine while there are so many other problems in the world. So there certainly could be an, an issue there. Um, Another interesting example that uh, was raised in discussion recently that I, I was involved in is um, what do we think about uh, drugs that give us an altered time perception uh, when we are uh, about to have pleasurable experiences? Um, I guess sex would be an example. So if you could take a drug that would give you the sense that you were having sex for hours um, and you managed to get that all into the 10 minutes that's all that you have available, um, would that be a positive thing? Would that, would that be a matter, something that actually uh, increased your happiness? Or would we want to say, well, no, that's, you're just suffering from an illusion. You have the illusion that you had sex for hours. You really only had it for 10 minutes. So if we're talking about objective duration waiting, as Kahneman did, um, we ought only to count it for 10 minutes. I'm, I'm not sure about that. It does seem to me that it, it, if you could slow down time perception, it might actually increase your uh, enjoyment. Uh, and um, finally, of course, I should mention that um, genetic selection is also a possibility here at some point. We identify genes that lead to um, different, differing moods. Obviously, if we identify genes that lead to severe clinical depression, um, would be a major plus for enhancing happiness to give parents the option of not having a child who is likely at high risk of being severely depressed, because that, I think, is one of the huge amounts of causes of, of unhappiness in the world. Um, but it, and if you do that, what if we have a more subtle, nuanced uh, uh, understanding of genes and mood so that we have children, which we can choose to have children who are on balance somewhat more cheerful, still quite within the normal range, but somewhat more cheerful rather than somewhat less cheerful. Is that something that would be a good thing to do? Seems to me that there's a reasonable case for saying that it would be. Okay, I think I'm pretty much out of time. Um, I think I've given you enough material and uh, Nicholas Agar enough material to comment on. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your comments.